Hello and welcome everyone to FlowFest 22. I'm super excited to actually start the architecture stream with my session uh, around dynamic user experience through models, not code. We're going to uh, first have a, a look at the uh, agenda. But before we get started, uh, some quick notes. First of all, all our sessions today will be recorded. So um, don't worry if you miss uh, one or two of these sessions, you, are, uh, you will be able to look at them later on as we publish them and uh, bring them online anytime. Throughout the session, if you have any question, you can post them in, in the box uh, below my, uh, my window and we will collect all the questions. We have uh, people waiting for your questions to arise. We collect them at, at the end of the session, there will be a Q&A uh, part where we will go into some of those questions and uh, try as, uh, to answer as many as possible. All right, so let's get started. What I want to talk about uh, today is why, first of all, why user experience uh, is important for process automation as well. Then we are going to have a look at uh, the toolbox of Local. What do we have in our um, tool set uh, especially from the side of the modeling part, obviously, uh, in regards of user experience. I'm not covering uh, the whole stuff around user design uh, or user interaction in particular, more like the general term, the user experience, the user journeys, and why they matter for process automation as well. Uh, a big part will be life, obviously. So we have, uh, first I will uh, introduce you to the um, use case that I prepared for the live demo and also how we, uh, what type of models that we're using, how we actually built uh, the, the demo case. And of course, we're going to look at it from a live perspective, and hopefully we still have time to, um, to extend the use case as we go, to really use global design, to extend the models, deploy, and kind of rerun uh, the whole uh, set, so you can see how easy it is to use the global tooling global design in particular, uh, create your models, deploy them, and, and uh, directly test them live. And of course, I said at the end, we will have a QA and a session. Now, when we talk about user experience and user journeys, you probably all know that this is super important nowadays when you design uh, web applications, um, when you design mobile applications, user experience and design is everywhere. Uh, especially after uh, all those social uh, media apps have been uh, evolved. Um, nowadays, even for enterprise software, it's expected uh, for them to look nice, to, to be easy to use, understandable, uh, and so on. But why should we even care for business automation? So before we take on that one, uh, here's a statement from uh, Don Norman, who's kind of the father or at least the inventor of the term user experience where you can see that a, a product, let's call it a product, whether that be a web application, enterprise application, or in our case, a uh, business automation, a process into end process, whatever you design with global, uh, why you should actually care the, the, the users that are uh, being involved, their experience, how they interact with the system, how they use uh, or do their work uh, eventually, that all should really uh, work uh, seamlessly uh, in, in an overall um, user journey. And that's what we're going to uh, focus on in, in today's session. And yes, that's what I already mentioned. User experience is super important for business automation too. It can um, increase adoption. If you, uh, if you automate a process and bring it live, you want your users, uh, whether that be employees, customers, end customers, partners, whatever you integrate, in your uh, automation, they should feel comfortable. Uh, it should be a nice uh, experience working and uh, uh, being integrated in, in a process like that. Because we hear a lot of time when we talk about user experience and business automation, well, I only want to automate my work, right? I want to integrate data flows. I want to make sure that the data flows through different um, interactions, users, and eventually into my systems, right? That's all I should care about. And we say, no, you should also care about the user journeys, about the experience that all your participants in those um, cases or processes will have. 
Now, first, we're going to have a quick look at what type of models we are actually having when, when it comes down to user experience. I'm not going to cover all the different types of models we have at Flowable. It's a lot, I can tell you. So in particular, I'm not going into the basic and major uh, models like uh, business process management, BPMN or CMN or DMN. We will see a little bit of that um, uh, for sure. But I'm mostly covering the ones that are, have direct um, impact on the user experience. First of all, we have forms, right? So whenever there's a way to um, show data as part of your case process, uh, so in particular, when you have to enter data, there are four forms that have been, uh, will be involved. We have a form engine, which is super dynamic and, and um, can even handle super complex forms. They're dynamic in a sense, like if you uh, select option A, there's a full new section that you have to fill out. And that, that's going to be handled by the form engine uh, in real time as you enter data. Stuff might, might pop up to, to be uh, edited, uh, maybe even the validation change, changes according to uh, the data you put in. So that's all covered with the form engine, which obviously has a big impact on how you enter data and see data. The next one is important as well. We call them page models. You typically used for building dashboards. When it comes down to dashboards, it's an overview, whether that be an overview to, to get your, uh, your assigned work, or if you're a team leader, you probably wanna see how your team is progressing, how much work is left in the team basket, or you wanna have a nice overview, uh, statistics, um, uh, you wanna see charts. You want to know uh, or what, what the work is awaiting for the next couple of days according to the past experience and stuff like that. And by the way, did I mention that's all in real time in Flowable? Even if you have millions of cases running at the same time, our dashboards, they are served with real-time data. And, and uh, uh, even though it's real-time data and millions of records, dashboards typically render uh, below one second. So it's super fast. So you can really build nice uh, and interactive dashboards built on real-time data. Of course, we also use the, the form engine behind the scenes, but in a slightly different way uh, uh, when we uh, render pages. Now, another element that we have, which is probably not that prominent, is called case views. So we use um, case view models, and we will cover that a bit in the, in the live demo, of course, um, to dynamically show data to, to a participant of a case or a process, which is important to them. So it's fully up to permissions and the role you have as a participant uh, within the case. Uh, so the case might actually look totally different if you're a, I don't know, if you're a supportive participant or if you actually created the case or started the case in the first place. And that's all modeled through case views. Again, we use the, the form engine behind the scenes here as well, but the main issue here is how they can be modeled, how, they, how you can actually uh, define who is able to see what type of information as the case progresses uh, uh, throughout the uh, business automation. Part of the case views uh, are called case pages. So pages allow you to more fine grain define what type of data or even what type of view uh, pops up in, in your case. Uh, again, in the live demo, we'll go a, a bit deeper into what that actually means. In one thing which might not be that common uh, when you talk about business uh, automation is interactive uh, conversations. Think about if you have a case and you need some discussions, maybe it's around an issue to solve. Maybe it's uh, uh, around uh, something that needs interaction between participants. Nowadays, you typically use uh, um, emails back and forth, but in Flowable, we have a built-in chat. So right within a case, you can chat between participants. You can discuss the case. And it's even more, it's, it's becoming interactive because we have something like the digital assistant that's able to post notifications into the chat, letting you know about the progress of the case. We can even post uh, embedded forms, buttons, stuff that you can interactively do while you're discussing. You could approve or decline while you're discussing the case. And there's even more to the, to the chat piece because we also have integration with external channels like WhatsApp, WeChat, Line, 
uh, Facebook Messenger, what have you, and text messages, obviously. And I will use that in the demo as well. So you see, you will see how a user journey, the user experience can have, uh, be massively improved by using those uh, real-time channels like messaging. And another one, which is uh, a really important one is documents or content in general. So we actually treat content the same way we treat processes, tasks, uh, cases. It's, it's kind of a first class citizen uh, in, in our platform. And of course, it's fully integrated into the, the user interface. So you can see documents, whether those be Word documents, um, might be Excel files, uh, PowerPoints, PDF, obviously images. And uh, you don't have to download them first to open them up or whatever. You can directly look at the, those uh, documents within a case uh, through case views, task views, uh, wherever that sort of content is necessary. And then we have something which we call actions. Actions are a great way to uh, give options to the, to the users at, a, at different places. We can, we can expose actions, as I mentioned before, to a conversation. Now, uh, while you're typing and, and communicating uh, with each other, you could use uh, execute actions. They're truly dynamic. So depending on the state of the case or the conversation, they might come up or disappear according to stuff you can actually do. And if you think about it, uh, that might be pretty complex. When do I show some action when, when something becomes available? But as we will see later, that's all fully controlled by the case model itself. So through modeling, not code. Then we have templates. Templates are a good way to create um, emails, for instance, uh, as, as dynamic templates. So you can fill in data from the case uh, as you want to send out an email from within a case. Maybe you want to fill in, I don't know, the name of the customer, the address, uh, whatever you have as part of the case data, you want to uh, make that part of the email that you want to send out. So templates are a great way to, to, to uh, draft um, emails or to create documents. So we have support for textual based content, PDF and Word that you can use. And they can be created as part of your um, uh, case or process as you uh, as, as you progress. And then you can send them out through the channels I just mentioned, like um, conversation. You can uh, publish or kind of put uh, a document in there directly or send it out via email, of course. So the next one is uh, pretty powerful as well. We call them events or channels. There's different um, out-of-the-box channels that we support, starting with email, an obvious one. Uh, we cannot only send emails from within a case or a process uh, to the outside world, but we can even um, listen to inbound email events. So if, if you send out an email to a client, for instance, and they reply, that email is directly sent to the case where it was sent uh, sent out from in the first place. And then it might trigger some processing part, like somebody needs to process the email content. We can automatically extract attachments, content from the email, uh, and put that into the case. The email, of course, is as, as well available within the case, so that all the data, everything that is related to that particular issue you're covering, is stored and uh, available within that case. All right, so now demo time. Uh, the first, I want to introduce a bit of uh, the use case that I was uh, coming up, up with. I first thought like, what, what um, uh, use case I should use for this session to, to really, uh, my, my goal was to use uh, uh, as many as those models that we just uh, went through. To, to showcase how they uh, might look like in, in real world uh, use case. I didn't want to go domain specific, so I took something which probably everybody knows working in an office, which is printer management. So we have different office locations that we need to maintain. Each one might have uh, one or more printers available. Uh, the different types, different printers, um, so you can get an overview of, of uh, what type of printers you have at each location. But of course, we need to keep them running. Um, so there's a regular service being done, uh, which can be um, set up uh, how many times you want to do regular service. 
but still if you do a regular service they might still fail because there's a paper jam there might be out of toner whatever the issue is uh if you want to print out something it's not working you want immediate support now we call that on the spot service support now everybody can actually report an issue and uh, what i came up with was you can attach a qr code to each printer and if you scan that qr code with your phone everything else uh, is out, uh, fully automatic. So it basically uses WhatsApp as a channel, scans the QR code, sends some information uh, to Flowable, which will actually then uh, look up that particular printer because that's encoded obviously into the QR code and then start a support case or support process, should I say. And then it's uh, interactive in a sense like uh, the digital assistant might ask you questions. What exactly is the problem? And of course, we want to keep you posted uh, as we progress with uh, solving the issue uh, and, and let you know in real time over WhatsApp. And of course, we need to know who, who to trigger if a support issue arises. There are different issues. So if it's easy ones like no more paper available or paper jam, uh, we, we, we might just forward it to the facility manager. But if it's a, a bit more complex like I cannot even send the document to the printer. Maybe we want to involve IT support. This should all be set up and done automatically. Nobody should be uh, able or should be, uh, you know, needing to take care of that. So the first uh, build that I came up with was, um, okay, let's, let's use data objects. Uh, I didn't call that before because it's kind of like a, a technical backend thing, uh, handling data. And it's a great way to model and, and uh, create um, data for, uh, for your use cases. So I thought like, hey, data object is a good way to represent a printer. I could create a management dashboard to manage that data, adding printers, having a look at the different locations and printers they're attached to. And of course, I could use processes and maybe even cases, depending on, on, on the support case, to, to um, support them, right? Then the case could actually map back do, do the uh, uh, print the data object, but um, if I have a closer look, how should we track the current state of the printer? Let's assume the printer is operational and I start a support case for that particular printer. Now, it should be kind of flagged as being supported, something's wrong, right? So letting other people know if they want to uh, use the printer as well. Or, what if we want to make sure that there's no contradicting processes running at the same time? Maybe your, your uh, printer is currently being serviced and of course it's not operational. So you should not be able to start a support uh, process right away at that very moment. How do we handle those kind of um, complexities? Now wait, this is getting too complicated uh, to keep everything in sync uh, at the same time, making sure everything runs uh, smoothly. So maybe there's a better way. So build two, um, what if we just use a case model to kind of represent the life cycle of the printer? And thus the case actually becomes the representation of the printer or is the printer. Because that gives us a, a lot of tooling at hand to cope with all the um, complexities around synchronizes all, all those events and processes and whatnot. To, to the actual state of uh, the printer. Having said that, the um, stage that we have, stage support in, in a case model, we'll look at it uh, in, in design later, don't worry, they actually represent the state. We map one stage to a state of the printer, right? That gives us a lot of easiness when it comes down to modeling the difference of, of uh, support and the state of the printer. And of course, we can use the case. So we can send events uh, to, to the case to support process. We can trigger that through an event. And of course, we can make sure um, that you cannot uh, or not and at a state, state where the printer is not rec cannot receive those kinds of events. So we can be as dynamic and flexible as we need to be. Now, um, of course, we also want to uh, make use of the dynamic case view. So we will uh, use that as well. Running processes within this, uh, we can send uh, the WhatsApp event, the to start a support process, stuff like that. So it makes it very much easier 
than if I would use loosely coupled process fragments and use a data object to try putting it down. Before we get uh, started into the, uh, the the live demo, here's the three participants I use throughout the demo case. So I, have, I apply myself as the one trying to use a printer, being in the office, and of course it doesn't work. So I need to support an issue. Two people to my particular location, and Barton, facility manager, of uh, like paper jams, no more paper, uh, whatever, um, is is uh, routed to her directly. And I have Shane Bowen. He's the IT support for more complex stuff. I'm going to use or issue will be routed to him to, 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 to be fixed. So those are the three people that I'm going uh, to, uh, to use throughout the demo. Let me see if I run out of a timeout. No, I didn't, which is great. All right. This cool. So I have different um, views that, I, that you see here. So on the right hand side, you see my uh, smartphone that I will use uh, to start the communication. And on, on the other um, end, I have um, the dashboard, kind of like the, the global default uh, UI um, that, that I, I can use to see my list of printers, locations, and see what's going on in my, with my support cases. So before we go into design, the part like how was that all built, uh, let me um, quickly introduce the different parts we have. So on the left-hand side, we have all uh, the locations. So for instance, if I choose uh, Switzerland, I can see that the, the address. I can also see the assigned facility manager. Like I said before, it's Anne Barton and IT support is handled by Shane Bowen. This is what we call master data. And of course, Flowable is also able to uh, let you design and manage um, master data, whether that be directly managed within Flowable or uh, is coming from an external system, it doesn't matter. Then on the right, we have our list of, let me see what we have in Zurich. So I basically have two, two printers uh, set up in, in Zurich. And let me see that one quickly. So I also, when I uh, basically um, click on a printer, I see the overview. Now this is built through a case view model as we see before in, in the introduction. I will cover that a bit more in the, uh, go and have a look at, at design. But for now, you can see that the left-hand side here, as we progress through uh, the use case, you will see that this will be changing depending on the state of the printer. We always have the overview. We see a couple of uh, information about, uh, about the um, printer. We see some uh, information what, what it supports. And of course, we can also even see uh, uh, have a look at the location. And just to be precise, that's exactly the, the building that I'm sitting in right now. And um, when we want, uh, want to get started with a, a reporting issue of a support case, we can scan the QR code. So let me do that first. I take my phone and open the QR code scanner. I scan it, it should take me to WhatsApp. And then I can actually start uh, the support case. All right. Now, first, you will see that. Um, oh, let me make that bigger. Okay. I, I get an immediate feedback from the digital assistant by uh, looking up the appropriate printer, uh, giving me a, a small image like, hey, is this really the, the, the right printer? Did we attach the right QR code to the printer? And uh, then I can use the. Um, what's called a WhatsApp interaction message. Uh, it's a feature of WhatsApp, which is pretty nice. It allows you to, instead of just typing, uh, I can uh, make use of a pretty fine selection. So I could use whether I have paper jam, no paper, or I can report any other issue I'm facing. And then of course I would, would, would need to type, but let's get started easily by saying, hey, I have some paper jam. I can send that. And I also get immediate feedback uh, through WhatsApp um, that um, the 
uh, support process has been started. Now, if we are correct, that should actually have been routed to N. So I have to log in as N to see if that's true. As you can see in my conversation section, I have two messages. Of course, if, I, uh, if I'm if i Ann Barton, I probably have my phone with me and I would have been notified in real time that there's something happening. And I can look at it right within my conversation. Now, this is super cool. As you can see, it's not only a conversation where you can type in messages and probably post uh, images or whatnot or documents. It's even interactive in a sense, as you can see here, we call that an embedded form. So for easy stuff, like in my case, uh, taking care of support, I have all the relevant information. I know the printer, I see even the, the image of where it is. Um, I can see the support request type, like paper jam in my case. And I can really solve the issue right away here inside of my conversation. Of course, maybe I need more details. Maybe I want to know what's going on. Of course, I can directly click on here and it takes me to the, uh, the case, right? So within the case, I see, pay attention to the left-hand side. Previously, we just saw overview and open tasks, conversation and, 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 and uh, stuff like that. But now we have more. That's the dynamic part of uh, when, whenever you reach a state of uh, within your case, it might actually expose more information. Like I have a support view. So I know the printer is currently being supported. I even have my task. That's the very same form that I saw previously in my conversation, right? I have that here as part of my case. I would even found it through my open tasks, right? So there's a, a task support printer assigned to me. I can click on that one. So there's many ways how you can uh, get to your work. So that's what we call uh, user journeys, right? Depending where you are right now, are you sitting in your task box and then a task pops up? Are you more like you're, you're working with conversations Then it pops up there as well? So it's up to you what channels you want to use uh, to get work done. Of course, I can also uh, go in and see the whole uh, conversation that's running on WhatsApp. I could, could even uh, send back a message and start communicating if I need more information. We will do that a bit later. And um, let me go back to the conversation here that we had and uh, solve it from there. Again, I could have solved it as part of the case, but let's make it a bit more interesting here. Let's make sure we see um, the WhatsApp window. So whenever I say, okay, okay, fixed, let's go. I can say problem fixed. Here, I could even go beyond and say, I need an external technician. It, it's, it's, it's really that paper jam is, is something else. I cannot fix it myself. I could involve IT, uh, I could involve an external technician of, of, the, of the printer, whatever it's needed, right? So you make the, 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 the process um, as, as needed. But for now, let's just fix the problem. And of course, as, as you can see, there's immediate feedback um, to, to WhatsApp as well. So I can see, oh, the problem is fixed. I can even see the resolution uh, of my facility manager if, if, uh, if, if need be, right? So those messages can actually be pretty dynamic as we see. Right, now gets back to my printer management. And of course, again, it's now back to be uh, being operational. Now, I can um, make, a, make another case and uh, uh, now route it to Shane Bowen because we saw we could set up the master data uh, accordingly. But let's uh, add something more uh, interesting. So the next step, we're going to have a look at Flowable Design, how that was all done. So I switched to Flowable Design now, taking up the, the hat of designing that use case. In Flowable, you, you, we are able to create what we call app models or apps. So I had an app called Printer Management. I also have one for the, for the locations, which is called Master Data Management. So before we get started, everything that you saw in the demo use case I, I showed uh, before was zero code. I was only using flowable models to come up with that um, 
uh, end-to-end use case, including the, the, the full WhatsApp uh, integration and everything. Now, let's have a look at, uh, at the printer management app. So as you can see, there's quite some um, models in here. So let's get started with the case model. That's kind of like the core, the centerpiece of my app. So I'm opening up the, um, let me make that a bit bigger. There we go. So this is the case model that actually, it looks like a top-down approach into your business automation, so to speak. It's kind of the orchestration of different pieces that might run as we progress through the life cycle of, of a printer. Because remember, we basically attached the case directly to one single printer to represent the, the full life cycle of a printer. Whenever we, we get a new printer, we go into the setup stage. So as you can see, those kind of boxes are what we call stages, I'm not going into too much details of Siemen, um, but they represent a single state of my printer. I use them for, for, for that purpose. And within the stage, I said, what, what needs to be done? I need to set up the printer. So from a top-down view, I only see one box which says set up printer. If I want to know what that actually means, I can down, uh, go down and I see an attached uh, process which says, okay, I need um, to, to, to figure out, uh, am I running on a multi-tenant environment? It's too technical, but I need a user task to basically set up a printer. If I wanna know how that looks like, again, I drill down and I see the form. We will actually do that uh, in a second step when we set up a new printer. And that's the form to specify my name, the type of the printer, the service interval, uh, and stuff like that. So that was designed using the uh, right. And the specific interesting part is this guy here, which which represents the operational state, uh, or state of the printer. Now we have two parts in here. Oh, three. We can uh, every time we can edit data. Maybe the IP address changes, or the location, or whatever. So, uh, and at any time, I can do master data uh, as needed. But here, the circles they actually represent event listeners. Send event as as long as the um, printer is operational. And for instance, here we have a timer-based one which basically say, I'm going to go into service mode whenever the next service interval is approaching. And then I, the service printer process that actually involves IT support or whoever it is to do this, the actual, um, is a box where we can attach a process fragment that takes care about a uh, service printer. For support, that was actually the one that was listening to um to my whatsapp uh whatsapp event right so i can see and click on that event here and see all 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 the the, the nest here so i will receive the cycle um the case id i will receive all the different information that was uh um, basically entered uh, through whatsapp that basically turns into an event and will be sent to the case and it, what, what happens next, it will go here to the supported stage and go into the printer support process. That's where we went through. Here, for instance, we sent uh, the, the uh, initial message, like uh, having the, the printer image attached. You can see that here. So again, it's everything is modeled. I have the data in my case. I can use it to post it to my uh, external channel. Uh, or for instance, if... I would have chosen um, the other um, type of support issue. It would go into this part and ask me, please describe the problem so I can properly support it. Uh, and then we go into a sub process that actually uh, adding, adding support. Uh, all right. Now, the views. I was mentioning the case view and the, and the um, pages, right? And the cool thing in Flow is they're directly uh, attached to, to, um, to the case model itself. So we can have uh, the, the case view as an element here, which is basically um, very, very much has the same features as every, every, uh, L, every task that we have in CMMM. 
and uh, you can use them the same way. So you can you can uh, bring them live into the life cycle case of of the case model. Uh, so here, for instance, the case view, it's always visible because no matter what state I'm in, what stage I, I currently uh, I'm in, I can always see the elements that I specify in my uh, case view. And of course, if I open the pages, I can see the backlink, I can see the overview page, the open task page, document section, the chat, the audit, everything, right? I can add items as I need. And the interesting part are um, case pages. For instance, here we have a case page that allows you to uh, set up an additional element on the case view. Remember the one when I entered support? That was actually this guy here. It, it's only available if, you, if you're in this stage. If you're not in this stage, that view is irrelevant. It doesn't matter because you're not in support stage, right? So you can really integrate the view elements or the UI elements or aspects of your um, case model directly within the case model. And you can add as many uh, dynamics as you need, like who's able to see it, who has the permission to see it, when it appears, when it disappears, uh, how, how does it show up on the left-hand side of the case view and so on. So it's uh, the idea here is to really have one model that takes care of the whole case lifecycle. And you can both have automation elements like the processes we saw, user tasks, but also stuff like uh, UI elements like case views or case pages. Now, the last part I want to do is, well, we now had WhatsApp as a channel for, for me as the client running and reporting and support issue. But maybe we want to uh, extend it. Uh, what about um, uh, uh, asking for a rating at the end? How did we do? If we talk about user experience, we want to know how user feels. What could we uh, could we improve? So if I go down to my process model here, I want to uh, to uh, extend it. Right. So I'm going into this one here, and at the very end. Um, Oh, by the way, that's also something I forgot to mention. Of course, we can also make auditing. And, and so if I go back quickly here, there's also an audit uh, stream that, that records everything which is important uh, during the life cycle of, of the printer. So we can keep track of how many times did the printer fail? How many times did we fix a paper jam or something like that? All right, now I want to add, um, uh, something like a rating at uh, the end of my um, uh, process model, right? So let's make some space here. And so in our toolbox, we have something like sending messages, um, uh, as I mentioned before. So I'm going to say, um, ask for um, ask for rating. I'm going to send uh, that to my uh, conversation. It's out of completion, so I don't need to remember all the names of those um, uh, of those built-in variable names and so on. So I could say that's system internal template. I use markdown as the content, and then I can basically say, can I please ask you for a reading? Something like that, right? And I want to keep track. Because I, I might use them uh, later on. And the next step is I want to uh, send that message as what we call an interactive um, WhatsApp message. As for rating. There are different types. I can use buttons, but I want. Uh, I think it's limited to three buttons at most. I want to have like a rating one to five, so I'm rather going for uh, the list one. And I can say uh, that the text is "Please rate your experience," something like that. Just rate. So there's a lot of things you can configure here, but the important piece is. Um, the items we want to add. So first of all, we have a section that we call that probably um, so, rating. 
I can add the options. I could go for from poor to, I could even add descriptions and I'm going to do that to weak, being weak, say good. And I go and add um, very good. So before. Very good. Uh, maybe we add a fifth one, which is excellent. That's what we'll aim for. Right, so we define the different uh, list options that we have in here. And I find it my last message ID. That's a technical thing. So we, we need to keep track of, of uh, for, for what's, up, what's, um, what's actually coming in. And Right, so the next step is this will actually send out the message um, to, to WhatsApp. Now we have to wait, right? We have to wait for the, the, the rating coming in. And of course, we have um, a tool for that as well, right, for rating, which is called an event. So we are actually um, waiting for an event. We make use of... Um, What's going on? Where's my cookie ran out of time? Okay. Here we go. So I say external message received. I can configure it. I have to make sure that uh, that my message is or my event is reaching uh my correct place here so there might be tons of messages and, and asking for ratings out there i want to make sure that all the event is is actually ending up at the right place the only thing i want to save is the outcome so kind of like rating so and here we go should be fine here's me say okay and eventually i want to give feedback right once we receive the uh rating i want to directly direct the feedback and say hey we received thank you very much or something like that so we can send another message actually just make it faster let's copy paste use it here um, send Thank you. So, uh, so that's all fine. That's all fine. Here we could say thank you for rating us with maybe we want to uh, even add um, what they rated us with. So we could say rating. Yes, here we go. We might even not make that bold. We use markdown. Here we go. All right, we should be good to go. As always, those live demos uh, might be something missing. I hope it works so I can deploy. When I publish, I and now we're in InDesign. I want to, to uh, publish my uh, latest changes. I publish them to uh, to Flowable Work. And of course, if I go into my printer case, I want to make sure that I use the latest definition. We have a tool called Inspect global inspect uh, that I can migrate to the latest version of, of uh, that I just deployed. So let's do that. And then let me start the process again. So I'm going to um, start scanning the card. And then again, it's the, the first part is uh, obviously the same. I'm, I'm presented with uh, the printer I've chosen. I can choose the support type. This time I go for no paper. I will have the immediate feedback. Let me quickly switch to Ann Barton. Go in there, say, um, I don't want to play Java. Then say, fixed. 
And here we go. I'm presented with um, the rating. So I can say I rate that was super fast. That was excellent. I'll rate back. And here we go. I see uh, the feedback of my uh, of my rating. And of course, uh, according um, the the feedback I I rate four, I want to improve. That would continue the the design process now here, but I'm out of time. So um, I was giving you an idea how um, Flowable can support really nice user experiences with all uh, and at our um, Flowable Work platform. But now let's see if we have any questions. I might want to add in um, Matthias, uh, which was. Uh, overlooking the uh, the session, hopefully collected a couple of questions. So, technical team, can you please uh, integrate Matthias? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? I can at least. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Yeah. Now we can see you. On the Hello. As well. uh, so we have a couple questions from the audience. Uh, the first one was um, whether. WhatsApp and conversations will be available in Flowable Work or whether this is an engage on the uh, feature? Good question. So first of all, um, the whole chat engine and chat um, piece, chat functionality that's built into Flowable Work as part of case management process task management. If you want to use external channels like WhatsApp, WeChat, that's where Engage comes in. Engage is just adapters on top of Flowable Work. It's kind of like adding those external channels to the Flowable Work uh, world. That's called Engage. So yes, if you want to use WhatsApp, WeChat, Line, um, you need Engage as an addition to Flowable Work. Thank you. Um, the second one, uh, or the highest rated one, was actually uh, the following. To create flowable forms, are there any plans to allow form modeling based on an uh, open API, API docs to make it easier to build forms based on our REST API data? So basically whether yeah, we can build forms based on open API. Um, there are actually plans, not only for forms, but, but also mainly for um, REST service integration. I didn't touch that world completely in, in today's sessions. There are other technical sessions that cover that. Uh, we also have a model to cover uh, service integration. And that's where we also plan to use open API standards that you can actually read in and already uh, create a model out of it. And the same for uh, forms as well. We use that internally for data objects, for instance. If you create a data object and you have external data fields, we also create forms based on that meta information out for you. And so there is a way to dynamically create forms out of existing meta information, like on a, an open API part or, or a data object or whatever you have. Good. I think that answered that question. Then uh, this is more an organizational question, whether the demo application will be available for download for people to try. Uh, absolutely. Um, the only part where I might want to uh, change a little bit is because I think if you download the global work trial, uh, you don't have the uh, external channels like WhatsApp I was using, but you can run the full demo with the built-in uh, 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 chat capabilities. And yeah, we can make it available for sure, because it, as I said, it, it just uses code uh, models, not code. Right. Yep. Good. Um, let me see if there are any other questions. We don't have too much time, but... Um, uh, yeah, there is one. I saw that you had a QR code UI element in the beginning. Can we add our own ones as well? So whether we can integrate our own custom UI components or experiences? Ooh, that's actually a really good question. Uh, first of all, the QR uh, code, that, that's kind of a element in the, in the form engine. So you can dynamically create QR codes on the spot. Uh, so so in, in my example, I was using the printer ID. Uh, to be added, and of course the WhatsApp, um, the WhatsApp API. To to uh, if you if you basically scan it, that it automatically opens WhatsApp. Um, but 
having said that um there's a really great feature of the of the form engine that allows you to plug in any type of dynamic or your own components you can actually create custom components as many as you want as versatile as they should be and add them into the form engine and they will pop up in both places in, in the form designer so you will see your own uh, custom components there and as well obviously in the runtime so whether that be specific elements for building nice dashboards or uh, case views, whatever, you can actually create your own custom components and attach them to the form engine. I think that's a really uh, expressive way to extend the out-of-the-box capabilities that we have. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, uh, mentioning that engine or views, they're embedded. You can also embed them into your own UI whether that be built in React.js or Angular or just plain HTML JavaScript. Rather, if you want to make sure that you have your own kind of framework of, of, of app that you already built or want to build, you can embed our components right into it. It's no, there's no necessity to, to use the only out-of-the-box global UI that I showed throughout the session. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and I think there's one more question. Will the uh, wait one second? Uh, is recording sessions available later? Yes, yes, it is. Absolutely. And actually, if you're interested in in more technical things about the uh, forums and uh, the the UI, there's another great technical session at the technical stream uh, from uh, Orlando that actually talks about and showcases how you can embed global components into your own uh, web application. Do we still have one? minute for the last do. question yeah i think we do yeah uh so somebody's asking uh, that we are integrating with whatsapp and whether there are other applications in the future i suppose this is talking about uh, adapters right uh which we already have a few probably messenger messenger applications yeah. i guess right yeah yeah yes uh we we actually add them a bit on a request sort of basis currently we have that online Facebook Messenger. We are planning to have a Teams, Microsoft Teams integration as well. So you could use Teams, uh, what I was using, and by Barton, end up in Teams uh, as well. And if there is a request from our community or customers towards a new adapter, we might, uh, as part of the role, of course, that's what we did in the past as well. Good, great. I think. Um... That's all the questions we have here. Um, all right. For the moment, I think that's everything. I think then we are at the end of the session. Thanks uh, again, everyone, for joining. And I hope I could shed some light on what Flowbill can do for improving user experiences in business automation. And now I think we have a couple of more minutes until the next uh, session starts. Thanks, everyone. And goodbye. Thank you.